Testing, testing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you all here this evening. I think numbers might be down a little bit because the Matildas are playing tonight. But we'll begin because it's six o'clock. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we, we start. If you do need to use the amenities, there are fobs um, on, can you hear me? If you do need to use the amenities, you are able to access the new Diocesan Resource Centre up the back of Mary O'Connor. Our librarian does have a, a FOB, so if you do need to use the amenities um, during, um, during the presentation this evening, you can access them over there. We do have supper um, immediately after this in the TUI room, so you're more than welcome to come um, over to share some light supper with us this, um, this evening. In the case of an emergency, we'll just gather outside, but I'm sure that won't happen. So let us begin in prayer and acknowledgement. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invoke your blessing on this country and on us as we gather today. We acknowledge the First Nations elders of this place, both past and present, and the continued cultural and spiritual connection to the lands and waters. We also acknowledge that our forebearers came into these sacred spaces, changing forever an older way of life. Bless our first Australians, brothers and sisters, and bless us. Help us to join our hands and our hearts together. Help us to heal one another and the land so that our lives may flow with harmony and that we may live with love and deep respect. Help us to continue your work with a synodal vision and a graced mission. Amen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our father, Richard Lenarm. So as you know, he is a priest of the Maitland Newcastle Diocese and was ordained in 1983. After graduate studies at the University of Oxford and the University of Innsbruck in Austria, where he wrote his dissertation on Karl Rahner's, Karl Rahner's ecclesiology, he taught from 92 to 2007 at the Catholic Institute of Sydney. During this time, he was a member of the Australian and Anglican Catholic Dialogue and served as president of the Australian Catholic Theological Association in 2005 to 2007. Richard moved to the United States in 2007 to teach at the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge and is currently professor of systematic theology and this in the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College, where he also chairs the ecclesiastical faculty. Rich's research and teaching focuses on ecclesiology, ministry, and theology of Karl Rana. He has authored or edited nine books. He is editorial consultant for theological studies and served as a theological advisor to the preparation of Light of the Southern Cross in 2019, a document on reforming governance in the Catholic Church in Australia. And most recently, Richard was a member of the Theological Panel for the um, Plen Plenary Council of Australia in 2021 and 22. In Richard's most recent publication, Tilling the Ch Church, Theology for an Unfinished Project, he presents a theology of a pilgrim church. Richard shows how the ecclesial community looks towards the fullness of God's reign, but lives within the flux of history, the side of its relationships to the Trinitar Trinitarian God. In this way, 
God's grace tills the church, constantly refreshing the traditions of, of faith and prompting the discipleship that embodies the gospel. Tilling the church explores the possibilities for a more faithful, just and creative church, one responsive to the movements of grace. Fruitful engagement with grace requires the church's conversion, the ongoing formation of a community whose words and actions reflect, reflect the hope that grace engenders. And we do have um, copies of that particular um, publication for sale this evening if you would like to purchase that. We also do have a couple of copies in the library as well. So it gives me great pleasure to, um, to introduce Father Richard and we're really looking forward to hearing um, your reflections tonight. Thank you. I know that uh, the, the most important thing going on tonight is the Matildas, so I'll leave out the last 20 pages of my lecture so we can all get home in time to see them. So my topic tonight is shaping the church's future, the grace of creative faithfulness. Key indicators of active engagement in the life of the Christian church have been in steady decline in Australia as in other parts of the world for the last few decades. Departures from once customary forms of be religious belonging are now so common that sociologists of religion have devised a distinctive vocabulary for the phenomenon. No longer do older terms such as drifted away, lapsed or inactive adequately account for statistics reporting the reduced practice of Christian faith. What confronts those interested in the future of today's Christian communities is a changed religious environment. The unique element of the contemporary context is that many people have explicitly renounced participation in the church, opting to forego any engagement with religious faith and the churches that propagate it. The newly coined sociological terms that capture the decisive nature of this choice include disaffiliated, nuns, and duns. The decline in church membership is the clearest manifestation of the trend away from Christian faith, but not its only implication. Since fewer people desire any association with the Christian community, religious literacy is also waning. Consequently, even the word God is now less accessible than was true in former times. The loss of religious language as a common social currency, as well as the diminished familiarity with the rhythms of religious practice, and the sacred text of communities of faith combine to make it unlikely that the churches will continue to fulfill their long-standing role as a social glue and source of collective comfort in times of need. Conversely, negative critiques of religious community become louder and gain greater traction as the faith of these communities moves from the centre of society to its margins. These critiques are especially evident when the values of religious communities come into conflict with the now prevailing cultural mainstream. Major swings in cultural values and norms usually have large-scale, complex causes that germinate over longer rather than shorter periods of time. There is ample evidence that this principle holds true in relation to the religious landscape, particularly when developments in evolutionary biology and neuroscience seem to undercut religious claims. Society-wide influence can smooth the path to disaffiliation, but this choice also has a basis in factors particular to each person who ends their involvement in the religious community that has featured in their history. 
Indeed, social critiques of religious faith tend to resonate most strongly with those whose personal experiences of the church have been discouraging. When churches have been unwelcoming or unable to nurture the spiritual growth of their members, the appeal of arguments for disaffiliation multiplies. For Catholics amongst the nuns and duns, circumstances within their church are often the principal catalyst for their exit from the community. The ties that connect adult Catholics to their church cannot always bear the weight of disappointment with uninspiring liturgy and uninspired preaching, with frustration at the lack of shared governance and dissatisfaction with lukewarm commitments to social justice. As noteworthy as are these concerns, it is the clerical sexual abuse crisis, which has now extended over two decades, that has made continued involvement in the life of the church untenable for many who describe themselves as former Catholics. The crimes perpetrated by ordained priests have gravely harmed children and vulnerable adults and radically impaired trust in the church's capacity to be a safe space. Equally, attempts by some of the church's bishops to cover up abuse and even to discredit the survivors of crimes have exacerbated the process of alienation from the church. Since bishops and priests are central to the Catholic Church's structures and sacramental practices, their involvement in the abuse crisis has brought into disrepute constitutive aspects of the church's life. The cloud over the church that the abuse crisis has sown can also eclipse receptivity to Catholic social teachings on matters of justice and cast doubt on the church's professed commitment to the healing that has its source in God's self-giving in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The aura of suspicion towards all things Catholic that the abuse crisis has stimulated reverberates in evaluations of the church's social stances, both past and present. The nexus between the Catholic church and the destructive effects of European colonialism on indigenous people, as well as the frequent participation of church leaders in the innovating battles of today's culture wars signify a church all too often on the wrong side of history. In addition, a typical appraisal of the Catholic Church as a social entity characterises the church as a body that is reflexively resistant to progressive movements and unable to affirm God's grace at work in the world beyond the confines of the ecclesial community. Other negative accounts of the church as a social structure showcase the lack of respect and care extended to Catholics who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community and the long-standing resistance to women's leadership in the Catholic church. Taken together, these critiques allude to a church that is a relic of an unattractive past. That past is one when the other was viewed with misgivings and institutions demanded forms of obedience com incompatible with openness to the questions, doubts, and groundbreaking ideas emblematic of the present time. All this at a time when the climate crisis, the advent of artificial intelligence, and various other recent global developments call for new forms of social imagination and action. Leaders of the ecclesial community might make the case that the Catholic intellectual tradition offers resources to address even the implications of chat GBT, resources that give priority to the protection of human dignity and compassion for those on society's margins. For the disaffiliated, however, the church's historical record, present day stances, and the gap between the Christian community's self-understanding and its lived reality disqualify the church from any role in addressing all that ails or puzzles contemporary society. 
far better then, so the narrative might go, to spare oneself the burdens inseparable from engagement with the church. Nor is it inevitable that separation from the church leaves a void in meaning and motivation. The current cultural emphasis on non-religious positivity and the longing for tranquil coexistence to which John Lennon gave voice in Imagine offer uplifting alternatives to a church that seems so often to be wounded and wounding. It is surely indisputable that reflections on the church's future must take seriously all that affects the church's present. This can be done constructively only within a way of proceeding able to embrace the complexity of the world and the church. Maintaining such a framework is no small task in our polarised and social media-driven environment that offers few positive models for acknowledging and responding to criticism. More common today than helpful guides for such response is whataboutism, which deflects every critique by deflecting it back against the accuser. You criticise me, but what about your failures, your prejudices and your mistakes? Although the desire to defend one's church can be admirable, it can also be misplaced, leading us to gloss over painful truths, ignore the lessons of history, and squander opportunities to ensure that our actions align with our professed beliefs. The influence of politics evident in whataboutism echoes too in campaigns that treat the issue of power in the church as the determining factor of the church's future. Viewed through this lens, a healthy future for the church is possible only if the larger baptised community risks power from the clerical minority who currently monopolises it. Lamenting the one-dimensional nature of this posture differs from endorsing clericalism and rejecting all potential revisions to existing forms of church governance. Rather, the reluctance to canonise all narrowly political strategies arises from the conviction that no such strategies ac accurately reflect the particularity of the church. As an alternative to picturing the church in a quasi-political way, this lecture will tack in the direction of a more theological approach, one that showcases the relationship between grace and human freedom. The thesis of this lecture is that the grace of creative faithfulness frees us from both unrelieved pessimism and facile optimism about the future. In the space between extremes, the space in which grace and human freedom meet, we as church can be humble enough to receive criticism without defensiveness. We can even learn to be self-critical. In this in-between space, it can also be possible to imagine change that will come about without civil war and without adulterating the church's inherited faith. Change that meets these criteria might well enable the Christian community to reinvigorate its hope and its engagement with the world, even in less than ideal circumstances. Such change is especially likely to be the fruit of grace. No individual or, or group in the church can claim a monopoly over grace. In fact, we can usually appropriate grace only if willing to move from our settled positions. We can all assume that God, especially on one of God's better days, agrees with us and is even grateful for the enlightenment that our ideas offer to God. Reality, of course, is otherwise. Authentic creativity begins with our acceptance of the difference between God and us. This acceptance affirms, as Johann Baptist Metz phrases it, that God simply cannot be thought about without this idea irritating and disrupting 
the immediate interest of the one who is trying to think it. Far from irritating and disrupting to no good purpose, this unruly God seeks only to break free from the limits we impose on God, the limits that prevent other people, and no less importantly, ourselves, from having access to the more of God. In the context of the church, disruption can come when we make space for a range of gifts, including those that come from sources that challenge our ideas on how God ought to operate. Our own gifts, attitudes and actions are essential to the life and mission of the ecclesial community, but not the sum total of all that grace can accomplish. Accordingly, the focus on grace implies that the possibility of a fruitful future for the church increases in direct proportion to the readiness of each member of the church to accept that grace creates spaces that are more capacious than and often markedly different from the ones that conform to our own designs. As a first step towards delineating the features of the in-between space that openness to grace makes possible, the next section of this presentation will elaborate on the two key elements in my title, namely the future and the church. The choice to proceed in this way might require some explanation, even justification, as it will bypass the hot button issues such as speculation about the next pope, the ordination of women to the priesthood or the abolition of celibacy that usually dominate conversations about the church's future. 30 plus years of teaching ecclesiology, the theology of church, and engaging the church's future with myriad groups have taught me that discussion of contentious issues in the ecclesial life always involves na navigating taxing terrain. This is so because Catholics, while deeply invested in the future of their church, often have widely divergent visions for that future. The resulting tensions might be unavoidable, but constructive outcomes from debates about future directions are more likely when participants address their differences within a shared understanding of the resources at the church's disposal. Building a common vocabulary and common framework for interpreting the church's future and mission takes time and effort. While it is not surprising that we might, might want to rush past this step, doing so is counterproductive tending only to entrench already well-fortified positions. What I am proposing is slower and more demanding than homing in immediately on all that fuels controversy. This slow and demanding path, however, can produce the convergence that results when all parties to a dialogue accept that truth, and certainly the truth that is God, is more expansive of our present grasp of it, no matter our perspective. This lecture's theology of the church's foundations, limits, and possibilities might not receive unanimous endorsement, but it does offer an alternative to unproductive arm wrestles over disputed topics. Further, the theological emphases of this presentation are consistent with the profile of the church as a synodal body, the project for which Pope Francis advocates so passionately, but more on this shortly. So then, focusing on the future and the church is not a diversion to run down the clock, thereby avoiding hard questions. It is, rather, an effort to ensure that this lecture's consideration of the future has a firm foundation in reality both the reality of the church's existence in history and the reality of the church itself. And so, to the future. In manifold human endeavours, from sport to transport and from health policy to urban design, the future is a topic of constant speculation. 
This speculation has its roots in the single most basic truth about the future, namely that it does not yet exist. Our talk about the future then appears to be liberated from the constraints that arise when we discuss objects with fixed dimensions. There is some truth here, but not enough to endorse the value of this view as a guide for thinking about the future. Since the future is unknowable in the present, we cannot guarantee that tomorrow will confirm today's imaginings of what is to come. Whether our predictions are energizing or dispiriting, they are not descriptions of what will certainly eventuate. Influences that we cannot yet know or evaluate will be no less significant for the future than are our predictions. Accepting that this restrictions applies to considerations of the church's future as well can free us from a powerful temptation, namely believing that our plans will fix the church in a definitive way, thereby sparing the church any future struggles, failures, or even joys. Even though the future will frustrate all attempts to delineate it comprehensively in the here and now, this does not mean that silence is our only option as we face our tomorrows. There are two factors that license creative engagement with possibilities beyond today. First, projections from the present can give some sense of what might occur if we persist in our current ways of acting or transition to yet untried strategies. Thus, climate scientists, economists, and demographers all use trajectories from our current experience to envisage the possible contours of the future. Even when tomorrow creates discontinuities we had not anticipated, we draw from known resources to fashion responses to whatever crises we face. Thus, although none of us had even heard of COVID before December in 2019, the vaccines that scientists created to build our immunity to infection relied on expediting the next stage of development for existing RNA technology. This was possible because analytic tools already at the disposal of scientists gave them access to the virus's genomes. In other words, as remarkable as was the science that delivered vaccines, it did not occur in a vacuum. The future never does. Second, and related to the first factor, any future we are envisaging is a future that will include human beings like us. This establishes points of contact with those who follow after us, just as it links us to our ancestors. It underscores that any genuinely human future must involve recognizably human beings, with all their complexities and infallibilities, and as well as their capacity for hope and imagination. When science fiction novels and movies sketch a future that includes forms of communication and transportation unknown to us today, our continuities with the human beings in the stories still remain evident. The future is us, albeit travelling at warp speed. Thus, even in Star Trek, people are still people. They argue and fall in love. They are, at different times, kind and petty, as well as fearful and courageous. True, they encounter forms of life beyond our experience, defy gravity as we know it, and eat meals that require no more than a command to the food replicator. But Jean-Luc Picard still drinks Earl Grey tea. Just as there are continuities be between human beings in different eras, so the church of the future will not emerge from a clear blue sky without resemblance to the church of the past and the present. It's not to say that the coming church will equate in every detail 
to that of the past or present. It is not even to say that large-scale and profound changes are impossible, either now or in decades to come. Future generations of Catholics might well be part of a church that enables the participation of all the baptised in ways that exceed present practices. But they will not be so unlike us that they will bring about a perfect church, one free of all tensions and frustrations. Since the church will always be, in the words of Eve Congar, the result of a synergy of a gratuitous divine gift that is pure in itself and a human activity that is characterised by human freedom, limitations and natural fallibility, the result of a synergy of a gratuitous divine gift that is pure in itself and a human activity that is characterised by human freedom, limitations and natural fallibility, perfection will not be on the agenda in the future, just it has not been characteristic of the church of the past and the present. The Second Vatican Council framed the church as a pilgrim, a community whom the Holy Spirit leads to the fullness of life in Jesus Christ, doing so through the vicissitudes of human history. The council taught then, until the arrival of the new heavens and the new earth in which justice dwells, the pilgrim church in its sacraments and institutions which belong to this present age carries the mark of the world which will pass. The pilgrim church in its sacraments and institutions which belong to this present age carries the mark of the world which will pass. Every generation of Christians beginning with the churches portrayed in the Acts of the Apostles, has been a pilgrim people, a people on the way, not a people who has reached its destination. We are on this pilgrimage now, and so too will be the Catholic community in the year 2525. The social and historical context of the church of the 26th century is presently unknowable. But the pilgrim church of the future will not be a saintly breed of Catholic Christians never seen previously, a people who comprehensively embody the life of the Spirit. We can therefore be confident, even certain, that our successors in faith will make mistakes and stand in need of ongoing conversion as we do today and as the church has always done. There is yet one more factor that establishes continuities between the past, present and future, while also ensuring that the church of the future will not clone the past and the present. This factor is grace, God's self-communication in human history. Grace is more than one among many influences in the life of the church. Grace gives the church its specificity. To elucidate the working of grace, the next section of this lecture will explore the second key theme of this, uh, of this presentation, namely the church. If a constructive approach to the church's future mandates that we be clear-eyed about the church's present circumstances, the need to identify precisely what gives the church its specificity is no less imperative. The latter task matters because, as Karl Rahner argued at the conclusion of Vatican II, the church cannot change into something or other at will, arbitrarily, but only into a new presence of its old reality, into the present and future of its past, of the gospel, of the grace and truth of God church cannot change into something or other arbitrarily, but only into a new presence of its old reality, into the present and future of its past, of the gospel, of the grace and truth of God. Rana denies that the church is free to become something or other at will. A corollary of this conviction is that nobody gets the church they would design for themselves. 
the present moment of cultural history has something of an allergy to such absolute claims. But at the heart of Rana's contention, the source of the non-negotiable he champions, is the recognition that the church has come into being solely through the initiative of God. This is what, why nobody can claim a right to the church of their own design. Lest there be any doubt about the meaning of this claim, a point of clarification might be helpful. Nobody here means nobody. Neither the Pope nor bishops, the most passionate reformers, the most ardent traditionalists, nor even those fitting none of these categories can be the architect of their own church while claiming it as God's church. The initiative of God is more than a historical fact, more than a feature of the church's first days that has become progressively less relevant over 21 centuries. Rather, God's relationship to the church is, and will always remain, the single most formative truth about the Christian community. The presence of God in Christ through the Holy Spirit is the primary stimulus for the church's authenticity, for the individual and communal co conversion away from all that hinders the mission of the church to be the sacrament of God's kingdom in the world. Yet God's church is not a church imposed on us, not a church that we are unable to influence or shape in any way, and not a church that transcends the need and possibility of reform. The acknowledgement that the church is beyond our manipulation can coexist with our freedom to shape the church. The two sides of that coin might seem to be contradictory, but are in fact paradoxical. A paradox that has its source in the fact that grace does not eliminate human freedom, but empowers it, drawing us to ways of living that manifest God's reign. Our God is not a take it or leave it God, but a God who, in the words of Dei Bourbon, Vatican II's constitution on Revelation, addresses men and women as friends and lives among them in order to invite them into his own company. God addresses us as friends and lives among us in order to invite us, in order to invite and receive us into God's own company. This account of God's self-giving provides the rationale for the council's description of the church as the seed and beginning of God's kingdom. God does not plant a fully grown church, but entrusts the seed of the kingdom to the community of disciples who share faith in Jesus Christ. God actively nurtures the growth of this seed through the permanent presence of the Holy Spirit in the church. God, however, is neither a micromanager nor a farmer who speeds to eradicate every weed that appears in the wheat field. Nor has God bequeathed to the church a blueprint to cover every eventuality of history. Instead, grace works in and through human freedom so that we might not only choose faithfulness but use our imaginations and, and creativity to determine, like the first Christian communities, what has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Our participation in the community of the baptized summons each of us beyond a narrow focus of, on self-interest or the victory of any one party. God's scriptural word exhorts us to faithful discipleship and the sacramental life nourishes us so that we might live what we profess doing so with enthusiasm, even joy. At our best as church, we are transparent to grace, responsive to God's invitation, and alive to opportunities to embody beyond the confines of our own community the hope that we have in Christ. This best, of course, is not our all-day, everyday reality.
that none of us can claim exemption from the need for ongoing conversion illuminates why it is that a healthy future for the church differs irreducibly from the triumph of any one party. The church of the future, then, must be Catholic, Catholic with a small c. It must be willing to embrace its own diversity as a gift, albeit a challenging one. Unity in the midst of this diversity is utterly a gift of grace, inseparable from the spirit who works through human freedom to foster holiness and to weave together the church's past, present and future. It is grace that sustains the faithfulness and creativity of the Christian community as it moves to the fullness of God's kingdom. So let's turn in the final section to shaping the church's future. No issue in the life of the church better illustrates the space in which grace, creativity and faithfulness can interact than does the relationship between preservation and innovation. This theme appears in the Acts of the Apostles and has rarely been absent from the life of the church. The weight of history and the exercise of ecclesial authority have regularly favoured preservation over innovation, seeing it as necessary for faithful discipleship. Nevertheless, new ways of interpreting texts, new expressions of sacramental practice, new forms of spirituality and religious life have consistently enriched the life of the Christian community, even though they have often needed to traverse inhospitable waters. At the beginning of the 20th century, Maurice Blondel, a French philosopher and theologian, distinguished the relationship between preservation and innovation from a binary choice. The church, Blondel stressed, with the help of the past, liberates the future from the unconscious limitations and illusions of the present. The church, with the help of the past, liberates the future from the unconscious limitations and illusions of the present. Blondel's formula is compatible with two interconnected themes prominent in this lecture. The value of in-between spaces that offer an alternative to either or resolution of issues facing the church, and the humility that frees us to recognise and accept the gift of those spaces. Humility is certainly necessary if we are to acknowledge the limitations of our present wisdom and insight. It is no less crucial if we are to be attentive to what the past might teach us, even though we live in the super-sophisticated 21st century. Humility in relation to the future evokes from us the preparedness to anguish over whether our resistance to innovation and our defence of preservation, no less than our promotion of innovation and our rejection of preservation, truly reflects all that gives the church its specificity, all that the Holy Spirit of God makes possible. Embracing humility as an everyday principle for everyday life as a guiding principle for everyday life, can be attractive in theory. Practicing humility in concrete circumstances, on the other hand, is far from being an automatic response for most of us. In the context of the church, humility is often in short supply, especially when we are invested in changing or not changing any aspect of the ecclesial community. At such times, the life within the church tends to default to the dynamics of a zero-sum political context, in which there can be only one winner, but a vast array of losers. This com competitiveness might well be ineradicable while ever the church remains composed of human beings. Still, it might also be true that a common commitment to appropriate a new, a shared understanding of the church can facilitate a less combative approach 
when disagreements arise over the shape of the future and the proper ordering of innovation and preservation. This shared understanding might perhaps cultivate more balanced perspectives, not only on our capacity to change the church without seeking to reinvent it, but also on the processes by which we make the decisions to embrace change or continue on well-trodden paths. The blessing of our present moment as a Catholic Church is that synodality presents us with an opportunity to take stock of all that makes us this community of faith, especially the abiding gift of grace. This taking stock invites us to discern together the concrete expressions of grace, creativity and faithfulness proper to today and direct it towards giving expression to what might speak of the spirit to coming generations. Synodality, of course, is no silver bullet, not a magical incantation that will dissolve all difficulties. Far from being a quick fix, synodality reminds us of the God who interrupts our settled plans and our usual way of proceeding. As such, synodality is fundamentally a call to conversion in order to aim at and produce a missionary communion at the service of the world. The gift of synodality to the church of today and tomorrow is its unequivocal reminder of the primacy of baptism, through which we become the one body of Christ sharing the one Holy Spirit. As Pope Francis emphasizes, the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple in which God works, the temple in which, with the gift of baptism, each one of us is a living stone. This tells us that no one in the church is useless. We are all necessary for building this temple. No one is secondary. No one is the most important pe person in the church. We are all equal in God's eyes. We are all necessary for building this temple. No one is secondary. No one is the most important person in the church. We are all equal in God's eyes. This shared gift means that a healthy future for the church can come about only when we commit ourselves to a shared attentiveness to the voice of the Spirit. It is surely no accident then that Pope Francis never tires of stressing that the key to the development of a synodal church is listening to the spirit present in each other and our world. As Francis phrases it, it is listening that will enable us to develop a new language in which to articulate our perennial faith, but to do so in the light of the new challenges and prospects facing humanity. We express the new things of Christ's gospel that, albeit present in the word of God, have not yet come to light. A new language in which to articulate our perennial faith. There is an indissoluble bond between authentic listening and discerning the presence of the Spirit, both of which give grace permission to rouse us from our torpor, to free us from our inertia, as Francis puts it, so that we are not complacent about things as they are, but unsettled by the living and effective word of the risen Lord. Listening, discernment, and synodality therefore interweave with grace, creativity, and faithfulness. This lecture has approached the future of the church not as a problem to be solved or even as a site to begin a new form of Christian community. Instead, it has stressed faithfulness to the abiding gift of God's spirit in the church, linking that faithfulness to the grace of creativity and the church's synodal discernment that seeks how best to give flesh to God's reign in our time and place. 
An obvious question in response to this presentation is, will it work? If this question is asking whether the approach outlined here will counter disaffiliation, improve mass attendance, neutralize every contested subject in the Christian community, and enhance the church's standing in society, then the only possible answer is no. A different response is possible if the question has a broader purview than immediate results. A question formulated with an expansive vision would ask whether our synodal exercise of grace creativity will further our formation as a community of faith and deepen our commitment to conversion. It would ask whether the themes canvassed in this presentation will encourage the church to be more attentive to the voice of, God, of the Spirit in God's word and sacraments in the whole community of baptised and in the wider world. Finally, it would ask whether the approach in this lecture could support the church's pilgrimage to the fullness of God's reign, renew the church in faith, hope and love, and so fuel the mission of the Christian community in today's complex society. To this question, the only answer, unambiguously and unhesitatingly, is yes. Thank you. Could I suggest, since you've been sitting there patiently for a good while, you might stretch, stand up, and take some time just to talk with each other, and then we'll have some time for question and answers.
Could I invite you to come back to your seats, please? So we have some time for questions and then to leave enough time for a cup of tea and get everyone home for the Matildas so we can, we can do this. So if, there are two microphones, so if you wouldn't mind raising your hand and, and wait till the microphone comes to you so everyone can hear. So if you have a question, be, Helen, just behind you there. Uh, thank you, thank you again, Richard. Um, the, my question emerges from my understanding of relationship theory and the, my involvement there in working with people in relationships. The key uh, question in my mind is synodality fit for purpose? And will it, and your exposition has really helped clarify that for me. I wonder whether another dimension which was perhaps um, unsaid but uh, still relevant is that in relationship theory and in we ask the couple or the people or the companies involved to listen deeply listen deeply and that is a process that is complex to help the opposite parties try to achieve something. However, um, without carrying on, I, I would like to think that listening deeply achieves a lot but what it sometimes does is leave is results in a new creation it might be with the same person, if we're talking about a relationship, it might be with another. It might be, as they say, most people have four marriages throughout their life. And I think if that's done well with the same person, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I, I, I just, that's what's coming forth to me, how that reality might be the next step or it might have been implicit in what you said. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I, it is amazing how often, if you follow Pope Francis's speeches and texts, how often he talks about listening. And he has multiple levels of listening. First of all, it, it's listening to the Holy Spirit. That, that's the, the, the overarching framework. Then it, it's listening to your own heart. And then it's listening to the movement of the spirit in each other. The plenary council was structured around the process of listening as part of spiritual, what's called spiritual conversation, which is not debate. It's first listening. What, what have you heard? And what does what you have heard, what does it mean to you? How do you understand it? What do you need to be clarified and so on. So the, the very things that you were describing there, Brian, that go, takes place in a, a counselling process. Uh, the thing about that is it's not primarily directed towards what's going to be the outcome because you, you can't know the outcome in advance if you are genuinely listening. That, that's the whole point. So when... People talk about synodality as not being merely a technique, but a way of being the church. Then it's a, it's a, a summons to us to practice this listening at every level of the church's life. In other words, it's not to be something that's only taking place when Francis calls these big, gigantic exercises like we're having this year and next year. But every aspect of the church's life should be synodal. That means there should be a practice of listening at committees, at meetings, in the life of parishes, in the life of diocese, with a, a, a deep trust that this will bring about change. 
that it's something more than what can we vote on and get out of the way quickly. It's ha- and it's also recognising that the process of conversion is for everybody. It's not, well, we're going to listen, I want you to listen to me because I want you to be converted to my ideas. But it's a mutual listening. That's also the language that Francis uses. That's why synodality, when people say, well, what difference will it make? You know, what changes will they bring about? If you could answer that question in advance, you wouldn't be practising synodality. So it's the process that matters. And trusting that the process, that the spirit really does move if we give the space to the spirit. That's why I love quoting that line from Acts 15 where the the first Christian community, as they faced their first big challenge, which was, should people who haven't been Jews have to practice the Jewish law if they want to become Christian? And so they gather, they air all the possibilities, they disagree, they take time to pray, and at the end of it, that little line from Acts 15, when they write back to the, the newly Christian communities, They say, it has seen good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And and I never tire of saying, I find that the most extraordinary line in the whole of the New Testament. That they could say, having gone through this process, we have come to the conclusion that this is what the Spirit has asked for. And that, I think, is the goal of synodality. Where we collectively can say, it has seen good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And you don't get there in the first five minutes. You've got to be willing to trust the process and to give time to the process and to be open to our own conversion. But that's where, that's what the listening can be the catalyst for. Just <clears throat> my question, Richard, and thanks again for the talk. Priests have said to me, uh, People advise us and we make the decisions. I mean, that's how we're trained in the seminary anyway. That, uh, and that it happens in so many parishes where, you know, the parish priests working on that model. Uh, someone has to make, the, you know, say, look, like, it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit, but who, how do they come to that? And then how, how do they uh, finalise you know, what the Spirit is saying mm-hmm. in, a synodal, in a synodal approach. And what would your comment be to those who say, well, priests and bishops make the decisions after being advised by, by um, the laity and religious? I, I think we, ha- we certainly have to avoid using that, that, that phrase glibly in the sense that that the spirit, as if the spirit is automatically going to, to share my opinion. I think it only applies when we're willing to go through that, that process that parallels what's going on in the Acts of the Apostles. So, it, you know, the, the, the heart of who we are as a Christian community is that the spirit dwells with us. But that's, to, to really enact that, we have to be willing to be remade by that spirit irrespective of whether I'm the Pope or not. So it's not simply that there's a one-to-one equation between holding an office and being in um, in conformity with what the Spirit is saying. I think we have to break that down and, and recognize that the need for conversion has to affect everybody. No one has a monopoly on the Spirit. So when Vatican II says in Dei Verbum that bishops have the sure charism of truth. Bishops have the sure charism of truth, which they don't define, by the way. They just simply state it rather than explaining it. But, But having that sure charism of truth doesn't mean everything every bishop says is the gospel. And having a sure charism of truth does not in any way exclude the need for bishops to be informed. The Spirit does not work in a vacuum. If 
What Francis says is to be taken seriously, that we are all equal, we all share the gift of the Spirit, then that sure charism of truth can only be exercised well in relationship to the whole of the community, not over against that community. And, and that's, that's the challenge of synodality. I was interested in uh, an article in the Australian on the weekend about ordinations at Banyo Seminary, and it was it's certainly worth reading if anybody didn't see it. But um, Archbishop Coleridge uh, made remarks about um, the perhaps ordination of married Indigenous men as a way of getting over uh, the um, the situation in regard to that, and reminded me. He referenced the Synod to the Amazon, mm -hmm. where Pope Francis received uh, advice, or the Synod talked about uh, perhaps uh, married men being a solution to a, a lack of, of um, church participation in the, the vast Amazon region, whatever. And here it was coming up again in uh, our own reflections on our own particular case of uh, in our, uh, our First Nations communities and the, the real challenges of church that we have there. Would you like to comment on uh, that sort of a, that hot button issue that does keep coming up and is something on people's minds, the perhaps uh, ordination of, of married, um, married people, if I might be a bit more braver, uh, to uh, talk about um, the, uh, the, uh, the advancement and the future possibilities for the church. Okay, thanks, Dennis. As a form and principle, I would say, as a church, we need to acknowledge that if something is a question, it's a question that demands attention. O often in our history, and this was true certainly in the first half of the 20th century before Vatican II, between the, the modernist crisis at the beginning of the 20th century and Vatican II, uh, things basically were not allowed to be questions. Right? We had lots of answers, but very little space for questions. I, I, I think what we struggle with still is allowing questions to be present and allowing the question to be something that calls for a response from us. So, in the, the context of ordaining married men, and ultimately even the context of whether it becomes possible to ordain women, if these are questions that are coming up in the Christian community, are these the work of the Holy Spirit, or are they not? And if they are the work of the Holy Spirit, what, what are they asking of us? And how might we go about addressing that? So I, I didn't read Mark Coleridge's um, comments, but you know, the, the sin of the Amazon certainly is an example of, even though it ended in a somewhat indeterminate way about the possibility of ordaining married men, it, I think Francis, in what he said at the conclusion of that synod, recognised that that question is not going to go away. And it's the questions that won't go away that are most often likely to be the questions that are coming from the Spirit. And that keeps summoning, summoning us as a church as to whether we're willing to let the question in to start with, rather than you, what we have done so much of our history, using authority to keep the questions out, which doesn't keep the question out, it simply pushes them underground. So it's much healthier when we actually address questions openly, I think, without knowing, what, again, what the outcome's going to be. Yeah, game of like everything in the church, it's a game you've got to play. Um, <laughs> sorry, Pat. Um, Richard, my understanding of Jesus' mission was to re-establish the relationship between God and humankind 
and between humankind, one member of humankind and another member of humankind. And that the church was a structural ancillary that came after that. Do you think if the church of the people of God, not just the structural institutional church, went back to that initial Jesus framework, that is restoring relationships, then the model of church would come from that as it did in the early church. A different model would come that would include things like subsidiarity, synodality, particularly servant leadership, uh, and that we just let it go, we let the present institution go and we go back to preaching that gospel. Well, two ways of thinking about that, Mike. One is that is that remains the mission. It remains the mission to, to, to be agents of reconciliation. What you can't do, though, you, you can't erase your history. For, for good or ill, that is our history. If we want to respond creatively, which is what I've been talking about, and talking about that tension between preservation and innovation, what's necessary, I think, is that we keep looking at whether our structures serve that or get in the way of it. And that, therefore, what is it about the structures that need to be converted? We are not, as a, a church, ever going to be without structures, simply because the structures develop in response to felt need. The structures can become dysfunctional, but there's a felt need for structure. You know? Our being here tonight is a structure. We had to have a venue, we had to have a time, we had to have other things. Human beings generate structures in order that we might be able to be together. Now, the, the challenge is not structures or no structures, it's how do you keep reforming your structures so that they don't get in the way of why the structures actually exist. So that's what I think the church has, needs to keep doing. That's what I mean about the importance of being self-critical, about the importance of being open to reform, of being influenced by what are the questions and needs of the present. But I, I don't think that it's a choice between structures and no structures. I think it's how do the structures serve who and what we are called to be? And what reform do we need to do in an ongoing way to enable that? that that's, that's more complex than simply structures or no structures. I think we might make this the last one so we can get a cup of tea and still get home. I can give a question for the cup of tea. Yeah, but, you're fine. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the images that you presented uh, is the image of the grace seeping into crack pots. Is it the right expression? Uh, from the comfort of Boston College, what do you determine are the cracks in our diocese? And how has the grace, how has grace manifested in those cracks? Thank you. It's really important for me, I think, as someone who doesn't live here, not, not to give you know, a commentary on, on life here from my 10,000 kilometre perspective away. Uh, so, w w without sort of claiming any knowledge in any great detail about the, the everyday life in the diocese, I mean, I think what all you can do is to restate or re re-emphasise um, well, the, the way that grace can operate in, in every circumstance rather than in ideal circumstances only. So part of that's the first thing. The second bit is then what together can we name as what stands in need of conversion? W what is it that facilitates the movement of grace in the life of the diocese and what is an obstacle to it? And then the third part is, what change might be possible? What difference might be possible? And how will that come about? Again, through a synodal discernment rather than being imposed by any one person or any one group. So I think all I can do in, in justice is try and name what I think the core principles are. 
but they always have to be translated into the particular context in which people operate. Well, thank... Is that on? No? Thank you so much, Father Richard. Um, you've given us so much wisdom and so much to think about. Uh, we know that the church is an unfinished project um, and we know that we need to keep planting the seeds um, and nourishing the soil. So thank you and thank you everybody for coming this evening. We might put our hands together for Richard. So we'll now um, move out this door for, um, for, some, for some supper. But before we do, Father Richard, would you mind praying for us, praying over us? Sure, I think I'm still, I still haven't heard that. So let's just take a moment to be aware that we do share the Spirit and the Spirit is with us and gathers us together. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for the gifts that make us one as a family of faith, as people who share the one baptism that calls us to the one mission of living in faith, hope and love. And we pray that we might always remain open to that gift, be strengthened by your word and your sacrament, that we might be an embodiment of your good news in our world. And we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.